Hey everybody, how's it going? In today's video, I will be showing how we can trace the direct descendants of King David and Solomon through heraldic standards such as the Lion with a Crown, the Rose of Sharon, and the Fleur de Lis. I will also be showing how King David and likely even Solomon had rhesus negative blood and carried the traits associated with it, such as red hair and blue or green eyes. This information will therefore corroborate that the Israelites not only had rhesus negative blood, but were of the R1B paternal haplogroup and descended directly from Indo Europeans. Now, before I start, I want to bring up something very important. This video is about King David and his son Solomon's descendants. And in 1 Kings 11, we are told that King Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, the reason King Solomon was allowed to have a thousand baby mamas is because Solomon was the king of Israel, the son of an anointed Messiah and monarch. This is a lineage of majesty and might, a lineage of which multiple messiahs and the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, have come from. Now, remember that Yahweh commanded us to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth with our seed. So by allowing a figure such as Solomon to have a thousand branches of descent, it would result in tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of descendants, linking directly to Solomon and David in the modern day. The earth would therefore be filled with Israelites, and not just Israelites, Israelites of Davidic descent, thus providing Yahweh with a plethora of potential servants, prophets, and soldiers to raise up when needed. It's laughable to believe that there is only 14 million descendants of Judah worldwide, somehow all being of different Y-DNA haplotypes. Solomon alone probably has over 14 million descendants alive today solely on direct paternal lines. Never mind all the lineages that are connected to him through maternal lines. Understand that he had offspring with a thousand women and likely had multiple children through each one of them. So I think it's safe to say that the tribe of Judah has far more than just 14 million members. This is way too small a group to be the tribe of Judah. Remember Ezekiel 33, which claims that the inhabitants of the wastelands of Canaan will claim that Abraham was one, but we are many. And this was fulfilled by Danny Dannon at a United Nations assembly. The four pillars that prove the case for Jewish ownership of the land of Israel. The first pillar is the Bible. The Jewish people's rightful ownership of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, is well documented throughout the Old Testament and beyond. Let us discuss our first pillar of proof, the Bible. The Jewish people's right to the land of Israel is mentioned over a dozen times in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, which includes the Torah, the Old Testament, the prophets, and the writings. In the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Old Testament, God says to Abraham, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. And I will give to you and to your descendants after you all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is the deed to our land. From the book of Genesis to the Jewish exodus from Egypt, to receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai, and to the realization of God's covenant in the Holy Land of Israel, the Bible paints a consistent picture the entire history of our people and our connection to Eretz Israel begins right here. It is not just the Hebrew Bible or the 15 million Jews worldwide that accepts this right. These inhabitants are not Israelites. They are descendants of the Canaanites, Edomites, Assyrians, Philistines, and even the Romans and Greeks, barely of Judah. Now, Solomon's descendants, as well as the rest of the tribe of Judah, were taken as captives by the Babylonians, 
and while some returned home, most of them were sent beyond Babylon. Beyond Babylon is Scythia, a region in which the Slavic, Germanic, and Celtic tribes can trace large portions of their descent from. So my whole point is, people who laugh at my content and scoff at me are clueless as to how many Judahites dwell in nations of European descent. One quick example, I tried to show Joel Richardson how he is an Israelite. And instead of replying with a well thought out rebuttal as to why I'm wrong, he simply called me silly and then ran off. But what's actually silly is that he thinks Judah only has 9 million descendants globally, somehow all being of different paternal lineages. What's actually silly is that he thinks the Canaanites, who fulfill zero Judahite prophecies, deny Christ, and carry a satanic star of Remphan banner, are God's chosen people. A group who has fulfilled the prophecy of Ezekiel 33 verse 24. A prophecy that the inhabitants of the wasteland of Canaan will falsely lay claim to the Abrahamic covenant. Thinking that they, only 9 million people, are many. Yeah, that's what's truly silly. And that's why I'm making this video. I myself descend directly from King David and Solomon on numerous lines of my family tree. You may as well. And I'm even going to show how us RH negatives carry similar physical traits to King David, who himself was of Indo-European descent and is described as looking exactly like Scythians who dwelled beyond Babylon. So with that said, let's go over the one and only verse regarding David's appearance in the entire Bible. This is 1 Samuel 16 verse 12, which says, and he sent and fetched him, and he was ruddy, with beauty of eyes, and very goodly to behold. And the Lord said to Samuel, Arise and anoint David, for he is good. Within this verse, there are two major hints that King David was an RH negative. The first is that he is said to be ruddy, and the second is that he had beautiful eyes. If we look at the term translated as ruddy, that is Strong's 132, the Hebrew term admoni, which means reddish skin, or hair. Now, cults like the black Hebrew Israelites will use this verse to claim that David had reddish brown skin, while completely ignoring the rest of the verse, which I will get to in a moment. Here's why their theory makes zero sense. Literally all ethnicities can have a reddish tint to their skin. White, black, Indian, Asian, indigenous, etc. You do not need to be African to have a reddish shade. And it's ironic how on one hand, Africans will make fun of Caucasians for turning red in the sun, but then go on to claim how we aren't red and how the Bible is talking about them. Understand that if this verse is speaking about David having a ruddy skin color, it has zero implications toward the identification of the Israelites, because reddish skin isn't exclusive to a specific race or haplogroup. But what would have implication and help aid in identifying the descendants of Israel in modern times is if this verse was speaking about red hair. The reason being, any race can have a reddish tint to their skin. But only one Y-DNA haplogroup is pinpointed as original carriers of the MC1R gene, which is responsible for ruddy phenotypes. This is the R1B Y-DNA haplogroup, which as we saw in my video on the tribe of Judah black Hebrew Israelites debunked, is the paternal haplogroup of nearly all royalty throughout European history, especially dominant royalty within locations that fulfill Judah's Genesis 49 prophecy. Now, understand that red hair, though more prevalent amongst ancient Israelites than it is in our society today, was still a bit of a rarity due to the mixed multitude that left Egypt with the Israelites during Exodus. Ruddy phenotypes are evidently revered in scripture, and the stressed significance on it indicates that the Israelites understood it made them unique, and separated them from others. They understood that these traits were given to them as blessings from Yahweh, and how these traits stem from our forefather, Adam, whose name means red. Adam, who was made separate from the beasts of the earth. 
And keep in mind that Rh negative blood, which is correlated to the red hair trait and MC1R gene, is the universal donor, yet not one of 612 primate types have it. If Adam was Rh negative, it explains how he was made separate from the beasts of the earth. And if he was an Rh negative, the universal donor, it explains how his seed was able to mutate or dilute into so many populations. Now I have numerous videos explaining how we can discern Adam was a redhead through the para Adama and rhesus negative blood. But for now, understand that the MC1R gene was passed on throughout the generations, and therefore popped up in the Israelites. It even popped up in Israel's brother Esau, who was the firstborn son of Isaac. So the MC1R gene is undeniably carried by the Israelites, as their forefather Jacob was literally a fraternal twin of Esau. Genetically speaking, Israel had to have carried this trait. Now, the fact that David was red-haired rather than reddish-brown-skinned is also evident through his son Solomon. See, in Song of Solomon 7 verse 4, Solomon is said to have a neck like ivory and eyes like the pools at Gezbon. Now, ivory is white very white, and it's therefore genetically impossible for Solomon to have a father with reddish-brown skin. Why? Rh-negative traits are recessive. They must come from both parents. And if his father was of African descent, he will at least be light-skinned, which is still nowhere close to ivory. Now keep in mind, recessive does not equal weak. It equals protected. By making our traits recessive, Yahweh kept our genetic blessings from being passed to the quote-unquote enemy, or Gentile bloodlines. This is yet another factor as to why we were commanded to marry inwards and form relationships with other Israelites. We would maintain our blessings and prosper as a homogenous community. Now here's even more evidence that Solomon was white. In Song of Solomon 5.10, his lover says he is white and ruddy. Now I will say, the word translated as white in this is not the same as Laban, which is the color white. The word in this verse means radiant or bright. And this is why the next verse says his head is as the most fine gold. This is not saying his head or skin is literally the color gold. It's saying his face shines and radiates like the most fine gold in the world would. And we know it's not saying his skin is gold, because the word translated as ruddy is not the same as admoni. Rather, it's adom, Strong's 122, which means rosy or red. So this ruddiness is referring to Solomon's reddish skin, whereas David's ruddiness is referring to his hair. And if David's ruddiness is referring to his hair, there is no way this verse is talking about a reddish-skinned African. Rather, it is speaking about an Indo-European with white skin like ivory who is either blushing or even sunburnt. Now, black Hebrew Israelites will say that I'm wrong, and that Solomon is black but comely. But here's the problem with that. This verse is actually narrated by his lover, the Shulamite. Not to mention, it's a misinterpretation. See, she says, I am black but comely. Does the but not imply that black wasn't seen as comely? She also says, look not upon me, for I am black, meaning she was embarrassed and did not want to be seen. Why? Because she wasn't black. This is an exaggeration and figure of speech. She was darkened by the sun after working in the vineyards all day. She was not literally black. Now, black Hebrew Israelites will also bring up that Solomon had hair that was black like a raven. So this means he must have had hair like an African. Well, keep in mind that the MC1R gene often skips generations. So the trait for red hair isn't expressed from sun to sun to sun. I myself have two parents with black hair. And my older brother also has black hair. I'm the only person in my family who is ruddy and has heterochromia. 
Yet this does not mean my parents aren't of Indo-European descent or that they don't carry the MC1R gene in RH negative blood just because they have black hair. They obviously do carry these genes because it's expressed in me. So King David can therefore be a white-skinned, ruddy-haired, RH negative with heterochromia while his son was a white-skinned, blue-eyed RH negative with black hair. Now, even more evidence proving that Solomon was neither African or a light-skinned is that he had eyes like the pools at Gesbon, and we all know that pools are blue. Now, where does the trait for blue eyes come from? Geneticists compare mitochondrial DNA from blue-eyed individuals in countries as diverse as Jordan, Denmark, and Turkey, concluding that people with blue eyes have a single common ancestor that lived by the Black Sea, where Noah's sons landed, around 8,000 years ago, spreading out with agriculture. The first blue-eyed humans were amongst the Proto-Indo-European Aryans who subsequently spread agriculture into Western Europe and later rode horses into Iran and India. So as we see, the blue-eyed trait comes from the Indo-Europeans from which Rh-negative blood comes. This actually ties into the next point about his father, King David, which is that he had beautiful eyes. See, one prominent trait associated with Rh-negative blood is heterochromia, which results in multicolored eyes with unique patterns inside. When we compare the eyes of Indo-Europeans who have Rh-negative blood to eyes of people with pure African ancestry, the African eyes seem dark and dull, with no visible pattern or uniqueness to them. And it's not just Africans because that's the standard phenotype for all races. That is, besides the Indo-Europeans who stem from Adam, the first Rh-negative man. This is not a racist belief, it's a simple fact. I've been complimented on my eyes since I was born. My girlfriend from 2019 to 2021 was Nigerian and Argentinian, and even she said she was jealous of my eyes and wanted her kids to have them. It's a universally known fact that colorful eyes are seen as attractive and therefore are sought after. So when we pair that with the fact that ruddiness was revered amongst the Israelites, we can easily understand why King David was goodly to behold, meaning he was beautiful. He was unique and carried the traits that were representative of his Adamic lineage. Now, I can already hear black Hebrew Israelites saying that Africans can also have blue, green, or hazel eyes, and that it's not exclusive to white people. They obviously have zero clue about genetics because nobody of pure African descent has ever been born with any eye color other than dark brown. If an African is born with colorful eyes, it comes from their Indo-European admixture, which they can thank the R1B haplogroup for, as they're the only Indo-European lineage that has made its way into Central Africa. So with everything I've brought up, 1 Samuel is clearly talking about how King David had red hair and colorful eyes with heterochromia, all pointing to him being an Indo-European with Rh-negative blood. And the ultimate point is, his bloodline till this day is found amongst nations with the highest percentages of Rh-negative blood, which are Western European R1B nations. That said, even Ethiopia, or Chad, the African countries with most amount of Rh negative blood are also the African nations with the highest amount of R1B Y DNA. There is an undeniable correlation here. Now, before I move on to the symbolism of Solomon and show how we can track his descendants through heraldry, I suggest you watch these videos for a better understanding of everything I just went over. There's a lot of info I wanted to add in this video, but left out for the sake of saving time. So, to move on and show how we can track his descendants through heraldry, I want to start with the fleur-de-lis. This symbol is often attributed to the tribe of Reuben, but I've recently come to an understanding that this is false. See, the fleur-de-lis is often claimed to be the mandrake Reuben gave to Leah, but the mandrake is a real plant found in the Middle East and it looks nothing like a lily flower. Furthermore, the main purpose was that it was used as an aphrodisiac, and the lily flower is not an aphrodisiac. 
So this is evidently not the mandrake of Reuben and is not a Reubenite symbol. But this raises the question as to why the fleur-de-lis symbol is so prominent amongst the royalty of Israelite nations, primarily birthright nations, and why it is used in tandem with other Israelite symbols. Well, the answer lies in Solomon, who is tied to the fleur-de-lis over and over again throughout scripture. There is actually five ways in which Solomon is tied to the lily flower. The first is the Song of Solomon. The second is the Temple of Solomon. The third is the Psalms of David. The fourth is Luke 12.27. And the fifth is his descendant Mashiach ben David. Now, to start with the Song of Solomon, there are seven mentions of the lily flower in this book, and all are tied directly to Solomon. The first two mentions are in Song of Solomon 2 verse 1 to 2, when his lover, the Shulamite, says, I am the Rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love amongst the daughters. Here she is connecting both herself and Solomon to the lily flower. The next mention is in verse 16, where she says, My beloved is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies. Later on in Song of Solomon 5 verse 13, she says, His cheeks are like a bed of spices towers of perfume. His lips are like lilies, dripping with flowing myrrh. In Song 6, verse 2 to 3, she says, My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to pasture his flock in the gardens, and gather lilies. I am my lover's, and my lover is mine. He browses among the lilies, young man. In Song 7, verse 2, she says, your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat, encircled with lilies. So Solomon and his lover are evidently tied to the symbol of a lily flower or fleur-de-lis, which itself was the choicest amongst flowers, just like Solomon was choicest amongst men. Now the next instance of Solomon being associated with the lily flower is in 1 Kings 7. See, when Solomon was building the temple complex, he hired Hiram from Tyre to do the masonry. He had pillars set up all around, each having the emblem of lily flowers on top. The two main pillars, Jachin and Boaz, also had the emblem of lily flowers on top. There was also the brazen sea, which had a rim lined with lilies. So here we see the temple of Solomon being riddled with lily flower symbolism. As we know, the temple is synonymous with Solomon, and he was the first to build one in the Holy Land, so it only makes sense that the lily was his royal insignia. Now the next tie between Solomon and the lily is actually through the Psalms, many of which were written by his father, King David. See, Psalm 60, Psalm 68, and Psalm 69 are all written by David, and are sung to the tune of the lilies. It is also thought that the tune of the lilies was played by instruments shaped like lilies, called the Shoshanim. Now, I should say that most people believe the fleur-de-lis solely represents Christ, and is not a symbol of Solomon. But one thing they're forgetting is that Solomon's lineage leads to Christ, and that Christ was a direct descendant of him through Miriam. So even if the lily solely represented Christ, it could still be tied to Solomon and David through their relation to the Messiah. But the connection between Jesus and the lily flower is not scripturally backed, and it arises in the Middle Ages. Matter of fact, Christ himself ties the lily flower to Solomon. In Luke 12 verse 27, he says, Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Here we see that even Solomon, the choicest of men, was not equal to the beauty of the lily, the choicest of flowers. And it therefore became his royal insignia, due to the reverence he held for it. Now, from everything I've mentioned thus far, we can extrapolate that the lily flower was a royal insignia representing David, Solomon, and the Judah king line, all the way down to Christ. 
And if that's the case, it therefore makes sense why we see this symbol in ancient Judea. See, though there isn't much surviving architecture from that era, we do have numerous Judean coins that depict the fleur-de-lis. The most famous of all is called the Yehud coin, which was minted in 4th century Judea. On one side we have the Eagle of Dan, with the Hebrew inscription of Judah. But on the obverse, we have a fleur-de-lis. This silver coin from Judea, dated to the Persian era, also depicts the fleur-de-lis, or lily flower. When we look at coins of the Hasmonean dynasty, we can also see the fleur-de-lis on multiple coins. So again, we have a tie between the lily flower and the tribe of Judah, which was ruled over by the bloodline of Solomon. Now in Psalms 89 verse 35 to 37, as well as Genesis 49 verse 10, we are told that the throne of David was to last forever. So when Judah fell and Zedekiah's lineage was wiped out, the throne had to be passed to somebody elsewhere. Over time, the fleur-de-lis became associated with numerous royal houses throughout Europe, but it first became prominent in France, where the Merovingians had used it as a banner, coat of arms, and a flag. Now, we all know that there's a lot of theory and controversy surrounding this bloodline, and there are even claims that they descend from Mary Magdalene. I'm not going to cover that in this video. But what I will quickly explain is that Charlemagne was not a Merovingian, and was only connected to the Merovingians through maternal lines. Now, the fleur-de-lis prominence in France is actually what led people to associate the symbol with Reuben, because as we know, people believe the lily flower is the mandrake, and it is true that the tribe of Reuben becomes most prominent in France. As I explained in my video on Reuben, they coalesce through multiple waves of migrations from tribes such as the Gauls, Franks, and Visigoths. Now, while the fleur-de-lis is not representative of Reuben, there is a reason why it first arises amongst Reubenite tribes. See, the promise of David's throne was that he would sit on the throne of the house of Israel. It did not say the house of Judah. Understand that Reuben was the original birthright son of Israel, the firstborn of Jacob. So the Davidic kingship would have been passed to a faction of David's descendants amongst the exiled Reubenites after Zedekiah's death. Essentially, I believe this may have been the first of three overturns mentioned in Ezekiel 21 verse 27. Whereas most people believe these overturns are the authority of David's throne moving from Judea to Ireland to Scotland to England, I believe it could be the passing of David's throne from Judea to Reuben to Ephraim. Now, this only means that David's descendants are ruling over these tribes, not that they're directly descendants of the tribes on their paternal lineage. Now, you may be asking, Judah to Reuben to Ephraim is only two overturns. What's the third? Well, this could be the passing of the scepter to Messiah the Prince, son of David, within New Jerusalem. Now, I may be wrong, I may be right. But if I am right, this doesn't necessarily invalidate the three overturns of Ireland to Scotland to England, because it could be a microcosm within a macrocosm. You could even argue that Reuben had three overturns, which I've explained to be the Gauls, to the Goths, to the Franks. So there could possibly be multiple sets of three overturns, three in France and three in the UK. Now considering David's lineage would rule over Israel forever with an everlasting throne, and that Israel's birthright went from Reuben in France to Ephraim in the Isles, it makes sense why there is such a strong component of Judahite symbolism within France and the UK. I suggest you watch my video on the tribe of Judah, which goes over Genesis 49 and shows how of all nations on earth, France and Italy are the best fulfillments of Judah's prophecy. From lion heraldry, to fleur de -lis symbolism, to the use of donkeys, to dairy products and world-renowned cheeses, to world-class viticulture and wine, which by the way is also associated with Reuben through his son Palu, 
everything points to Judah being in France and Italy, though France is primarily a Reubenite nation. So let's quickly go over the fleur-de-lis and its significance within these nations. In France, the use of the fleur-de-lis dates back to Clovis I, who upon being baptized adopted the ensign of three lily flowers. Notice throughout the video that the lily is often depicted in sets of three. Why is this? Well, you can make the case that it represents the Trinity, but you could also argue that it represents the three patriarchs of the Judahites. Solomon, David, and Judah. But see, there's also another set of three patriarchs. Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. So in reality, we have two sets of three patriarchs. Which actually reminds me of the two sets of three overturns we just went over. Judea, to France, to the British Isles, to New Jerusalem. Now, from the moment Clovis adopted this ensign, it became indissociable from French monarchs, who used it in flags, banners, clothing, coat of arms, coins, architecture, and even weapons. The original French flag was adorned by three fleur-de-lis. The current arms of the Kingdom of France is a shield covered in fleur-de-lis as is the Grand Royal Coat of Arms, and the capital of France, Paris. When you look at the Territorial Coat of Arms within France, numerous crests carry the standard of the fleur-de-lis. For example, Burgundy, Centre Loire Valley, the Loire Lands, the Heights of France, the Isle of France, etc. Even colonies such as French Guiana, Guadalupe, and Reunion Island have fleur-de-lis crests not to mention Quebec and Canada, which has it on their coat of arms and flag. Hence why Canada, an Ephraimite nation, also has the fleur-de-lis on its national crest. There is also the fleur-de-lis on crests of multiple ducal families within France. Some examples are the Duke of Orleans, the Duke of Reims, the Duke of Léon, the Duke of Langer, the Count of Chalons, the Count of Noyon, and multiple others. Some of France's most notable dynasties have used this symbol as well. For example, the House of Bourbon, the House of Capet, and the House of Valois. Now, besides flags and coat of arms, the fleur-de-lis can be most seen on royal coins, royal scepters, and royal crowns. In terms of French coins with fleur-de-lis, there are too many to list off, but here are some of them. When it comes to royal scepters, they're actually depicted quite often in royal coins or seals. This is the case for Philip I, Philip II, Philip IV, St. Louis IX, Louis VII, Louis VIII, Margaret of Provence, Francois II, and numerous others. In terms of crowns, you have the crown of King Louis, you have the crown of Dauphine Louis Antoine, you have the coronation crown of Charlemagne, and you even have the bust of Charlemagne which shows the lily flower on his crown as well as along the base. Now, a place with massive amounts of French influence due to the Normans, Franks, and Huguenots is Scotland. I've gone over Scotland's long history of lion heraldry, but I previously speculated that the fleur-de-lis used in tandem with the lion represented their Reubenite descent. Well, as we now see, it actually represents Solomon. So it makes sense why the fleur-de-lis is lined along the border surrounding the Lion of Judah on Scotland's royal banner. This royal banner dates all the way back to the 13th century and has been used by Scottish monarchs ever since. Here we can see Malcolm III holding this banner while wearing the fleur-de-lis crown and his wife beside him who is wearing her banner which is a cross with a fleur-de-lis at each end. In another picture, we actually see Malcolm wearing this banner. Other kings depicted wearing this banner are Robert III and King John Balliol, who is actually holding a fleur-de-lis scepter, though for some reason it's broken in half. Here is Malcolm III's descendant Malcolm IV, who is also depicted with a fleur-de-lis scepter. 
Now, you can trace the royal Scottish lineage all the way through to the final monarch of Scotland, and you'll see they all carried the fleur-de-lis and lion rampant in their coat of arms. Here are the arms of William I to James VI. Here's the arms of James VI to James VII. Here's William II and Mary II. And here's the arms of Anne of Scotland. These coat of arms were often shown on coins, and there are actually quite a few Scottish coins that depict a fleur-de-lis. Some include the coins of James V, where he is holding a fleur-de-lis scepter while seated beside a lion of Judah crest. Another is the coin of Robert III, where we have St. Andrew being persecuted besides two fleur-de-lis, as well as the Scottish royal banner under a fleur-de-lis crown on the obverse. Here is Mary, Queen of Scots, with her own fleur-de-lis scepter, as well as the Lion of Judah crest surrounded by two unicorns, which represent Ephraim. Here's another, where she is again holding a fleur-de-lis scepter, but with a different crest depicting a lion and a fleur-de-lis. Here is the Scottish seal of King James I, depicting his family's coat of arms, which has numerous fleur-de-lis on it. And on the obverse, we see James riding a horse beside another fleur-de-lis. And this is actually very similar to the seal of Charles I. Now, on the note of coat of arms, the Scottish coat of arms also has fleur-de-lis symbolism. Here we see the royal banner, which is lined in fleur-de-lis. And we also have the lion holding a fleur-de-lis scepter, while sitting on a fleur-de-lis crown. On both sides, we see the birthright tribe of Ephraim's symbol, a unicorn. And the symbolism of a unicorn being chained at the neck is that once Ephraim breaks free from bondage, through his repentance and turning to Christ, he will be past a scepter and his chains of bondage will turn into a crown. Not just any crown, the Davidic crown, which is lined in the fleur-de-lis insignia. This is actually how the real crown of Scotland looks as it is a golden crown with nine fleur-de-lis around its rim. In Northern Ireland, which is primarily Scottish descent, you have examples such as the Ulster King of Arms, which shows the Lion of Judah between the fleur-de-lis, as well as the Harp of David. Another example is the arms of the County of Tyrone, which also shows the Hand of Zara, son of Judah. And now, though Scotland and Northern Ireland are part of the British Commonwealth, England is actually the chief of the Commonwealth. I'd like to play a clip from Stephen Spikerman on the fleur-de-lis symbolism in England. A ruler in Israel. Israel didn't have a crown. They were the one who was abased. And in fact, they had been taken captive and nobody really knew where they were, right? But God knows everything, you know that. And so he was going to give the crown to those who were abased in Israel and take it from Judah's head and give it to a, 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 a sign of David, a descendant of David in Israel amongst the 10 tribes. And so the, remove the diamond, take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. So Judah is to be abased as history, history itself testifies to the fact that from here on she has ceased to be ruled by lineal descendants of David. Thus it is Israel that has to be exalted. Henceforth it is Israel that will be ruled by the royal descendants of David. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is. That's the Messiah, that is Mashiach ben David. Um, and, and, and what was to be overturned, it is the diadem, the crown, the throne that is to be overturned. Not just once, but is to be overturned three times. So now we're looking for a royal dynasty descendants of King David, where there have been these three overturns. Bit of detective work, if you like. But here is a, a, a coronation chair that is the official coronation chair of Great Britain, uh, of England. And inside the coronation chair, you have a stone. And that stone was the shepherd's stone of Israel, it was the pillar stone of Jacob. 
and all the kings of Judah were crowned on that stone. And you find, if you search hard enough, you find the scriptures to prove that. That the king being crowned stood by a pillar. Well, that's the pillar that Jacob set up after he went to his uncle Laban. Having seen the vision of the ladder from heaven with angels ascending and descending on that ladder and seeing Yehovah above and giving him a special word. And so that is that stone. And in, in, in the scriptures, that stone is called the shepherd stone of Israel. Now, and you'll find that in the blessing on Joseph in Genesis 49. So, because the shepherd stone of Israel is mentioned in connection with Jacob's blessing on Joseph, that means that Joseph is going to be responsible for that stone. And, of course, the stone is called the shepherd stone of Israel. And what has a shepherd got to do? A shepherd always has to go with his flock. And the Joseph people are, you know where the Joseph people end up, we'll talk some more about that, but wherever that stone is, that's where the people of Joseph are. Wherever that throne is, that's where the people of Joseph are. Do you see what I mean? So, now, the first overturn was from Jerusalem to Tara, here, this island there, Tara, in Ireland, Tara was the royal capital of, of Ireland at the time, and it was ruled by a, a sign, um, a descendant of David, whose name was Erched, Erched, and he's from the Zera line of David. And you know, the, you remember the, the, the birth of, of the, two, the two sons, the two royal sons that, uh, that were born um, uh, to, to Judah by his wife, the wife that he uh, didn't want to take, but through circumstances he was made to take her. And um, the, 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 the Zara came out first. Zara put out her hand, his hand. And the midwife put a red cord around that hand. But then the hand was withdrawn, and then Ferris came out, and the, and, and the uh, midwife commented on it that he, um, he was a bit pushy, Ferris. It describes the Jews very well, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and, and she made a prophet, prophecy over the two, to two royal children, the two boys, and she said, she prophesied that one day, the two lines will be reunited. And of course that's happened in, in Tara, in Ireland. And because of that, the harp of David has become the symbol of Ireland today. And in fact, the, the beer that they brew in Ireland, you know, um, Guinness, Guinness beer has got the harp of David on every bottle, right? And, and so uh, that, that explains that, that heritage. So here we have a, a picture of the actual coronation chair uh, in Westminster Abbey in Great Britain in London. And uh, it was prophesied that Jacob's pillar stone would be overturned three times before returning back to the land of Israel. So Jacob's pillar stone moved from the kingdom of Judah to Ireland in Tara. Now I believe that Tara is a synonym for Torah. And there's in the, in the Irish chronicles, um, I can't pronounce what they're called because it's in Gaelic, it's a very difficult name, but the Irish chronicles record that there was a prophet who came and, and this prophet brought the princess and, and the princess married their, their prince or their king and thus uh, the king was from the line of Zerah, from Judah, and the, um, the uh, uh, girl was from the line of Ferris, and the two lines were reunited. So Jacob's pillar stone brought, brought, moved 
from the kingdom of Judah to Ireland in Tara, and there it was overturned and went to Scotland in Scone, uh, which was an abbey, the Abbey of Scone. And all the kings of Ireland were crowned on that pillar stone, Jacob's pillar stone. For a thousand years, the kings of Ireland were crowned on that stone. Then the, the stone moved to Scotland, and for 500 years, all the kings of Scotland were crowned on that stone. Then the stone moved to London, third time, three times it moved, and all the kings of England were crowned on it. You see, so uh, for nearly a thousand years. So that covers that covers. You know, the Babil Babylonian invasion was about 556 or 64 or something. So that covers two and a half thousand years, and it's perfectly covered in the genealogy of the royal kings of Ireland, and the royal kings of Scotland, and the royal kings of England. So it matches perfectly. But there are many more signs. Elizabeth II, she is the temporary custodian of the throne of David. It doesn't belong to her. It doesn't belong to anyone. It belongs to our Father in heaven, and he decides who sits on it. So the Queen of Great Britain holds the crown by divine stewardship. She is merely the present-day custodian of God's promise to King David, as she possesses both the scepter and the crown until he comes whose right it is. And he is coming, we know. Hopefully, he won't be long. So here we have the crown, and this is the coronation crown of, of um, England. And all the, all the kings and, and queens of England have been crowned with this crown. It's called the St. Edward's crown. And um, it is a magnificent crown. And there's a whole story behind it, and a story that is never told, and a story that almost nobody knows. It's edited out. It is buried, right? I'm going to show you the story of this crown. Um, basically, this crown, is in design, is meant to copy, or be a representation of the, of the camp of Israel. You remember the camp of Israel? Basically, that sort of a shape. It might have been that shape, but whatever shape it is, we know in the north you had the tribe of Dan, who was ruling the brigade of Dan. In the east you had Judah, ruling the brigade of Judah. And their standards, the standard of Dan and the standard of Judah, were higher than those of the, the, the other tribes either side of them. Uh, Judah had, had Issachar and Zebulon either side of him. So Judah's standard would be higher because he was the head of the Judah Brigade. Dan was the head of the Dan Brigade. Dan was in the north, Judah was in the east, Ephraim was in the west with Manasseh and ben, uh, ben, uh, Benjamin, and then you had Reuben in the south. And then, of course, um, in another passage in, in Ezekiel, uh, Father God mentions that he has four faces. He has the face of a man, he has the face of an ox, he has the face of a lion, and he has the face of an eagle. And uh, so those are the emblems of the, the brigade heads. Now this crown has four raised arches. And um, these arches, those four arches, represent the four brigades of the camp of Israel. And then the base of the crown is, uh, is surrounded by 12 stones, by 12 jewels. Now, the, the people who are experts in this field, and I'm not one of them, they have found that seven of those jewels match those in the breastplate of the high priest. The chosen mispat of the high priest contains 12 stones. And this crown has 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, which were surrounding the camp of Israel. And, um, and then you see that atop the, 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 the raised arches, the four raised arches representing the brigades of Israel, you have an orb, a golden orb, which represents the world. And then atop that golden orb is a cross 
which represents our future king, the future king of kings of Israel. It represents our Messiah, Mashiach ben David. And so this, 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 this crown is just something else. Here we have uh, the funeral of the Queen Mother, which I was privileged to attend. And you see, on top of the uh, funeral, there is her crown. And you see, I, I don't know if you see a, a close-up, but this crown has got the fleur-de-lis on it. Uh, you can see the fleur-de-lis, can't you? You know, put your glasses on. <laughs> I promise you it's there. Now, the fleur de -lis. And you know, I really couldn't place the fleur de -lis at all. I had placed pretty well all of the heraldic images that came from the words of Jacob and the words of Moses. Jacob spoke them in Genesis 49. Moses spoke them over the tribes in Deuteronomy 33. And all I did is collate those words to try and find the tribes, because they were addressed to individual tribes. And the individual tribes adopted those words as their emblems, their personal emblems. And so here we have the fleur de lis, which is the foremost royal emblem. All the kings that are still there, and all the queens that are still there, of the royalties of Europe, they all are, have got the fleur de lis. And the French, when they had kings, the fleur de lis was their ultimate symbol of royalty. And uh, so here we have the fleur de lis on the, the crown of the Queen Mother. And uh, <clears throat> so when I was there, I wanted to know where does that one come from? Why is that one there? And so I didn't know, and I didn't know where to look or what to do, so I prayed and I asked Father to show me where does that fleur de lis come from? What does it mean? and so forth. And I prayed and prayed and I was not getting an answer. And I prayed for two months, maybe even a bit longer. And I was asking him, please Father, it's the one that's, I, I need to know this one. Anyway, one day I was reading uh, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew and then I had the Eureka moment. Because there it was, uh, worry not about what you shall eat or what you shall wear. Look at Solomon. He was, uh, he look at the lilies of the field. Lilies of the field. Even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And I thought, Solomon, Solomon. The fleur de lis comes from Solomon. So then I went to my concordance and I found 14 references to lilies the fleur de lis. And 13 were about Solomon, or were connected with Solomon directly, whether it was in the Song of Solomon, or whether it was when he built the temple, uh, or whatever. Four, uh, 13 applied to Solomon. And 13 is a very, very special number. And we're gonna go in that later. It's a sacred number. Um, so, and the 14th was about Israel. So I thought 13, Solomon, one, Israel. Well, Solomon was king of Israel, but the fleur de lis belongs to Solomon. So I believe that the fleur de lis was Solomon's personal seal. And you know, that's why all royalty have adopted the fleur de lis, especially in the West. And you find it in every one of their crowns. Also the coronation crown of England. You have a large cross, a bejeweled cross, alternating a golden fleur-de-lis, and it goes all the way around the crown. Now, we're talking about the triple lines of Judah. Every one of the children of Israel shall camp by his own standard, and besides the emblems of his father's house. So the children of Israel were really into heraldry. They were really into standards. Everyone had their standard. Every family had their standard. Every tribe had their standard, you see? They're really into it. And that's Numbers 2-2. Two, two. Uh, and, and they shall camp at some distance from the tabernacle of meeting. And Judah, this is the blessing of Jacob. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? 
the scepter shall not depart from Judah, and so forth. So there you have three mentions of a lion in Jacob's blessing on Judah. So that's why the lion is a symbol of Judah. But when you look at the British coat of arms and the Danish coat of arms, they got triple lions on that coat of arms, which also a reference to Judah and also a reference to David. The original uh, of the heraldic symbols of the 12 tribes of Israel are found in the words that Jacob spoke on his deathbed as he addressed his 12 sons. And Moses too addressed each of the 12 tribes of Israel just prior to his death. And here you have the lion's gate in Jerusalem. And those little lions are carved out in stone on the lion's gate. And um, there, the, there the lions, the, the, part of the triple lions of Judah, and that's why it's called the lion's gate. Here you have a window showing the lion and the unicorn in the palace of Westminster. So this is in the parliament, parliamentary complex. You find these kind of windows. And there's the lion of Judah on that side with uh, the flower representing the ten tribes of Israel. And uh, on this side you've got the unicorn, and I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but the unicorn has got this golden band, and there is a chain that goes down the bottom, and he's tied to the ground. Then you have triple lines of Judah in this quarter, triple lines of Judah in the top left quarter, you have a, a line from the Zerah line of Judah, and you have the harp of King David, and they're the arms of Great Britain. Now, it's important to mention that the fleur-de-lis was a prominent symbol of multiple royal houses in England. For example, the House of Lancaster, the House of Plantagenet, the House of York, the House of Beaufort, and the House of Somerset. One notable figure is Henry IV, who asserted the claim of his grandfather Edward III, a maternal grandson of Philip IV of France, to the Kingdom of France. He is depicted with both the Fleur de Lis and the Rose of Sharon, which we will go over in a bit. For now, understand that the rise of Fleur de Lis symbolism within England is most attributed to the Plantagenets, who had actually come from France and descend from the Franks. Their progenitor was Geoffrey of Anjou, otherwise known as Geoffrey Plantagenet. Here we see him looking ruddy just like David, and having blue eyes just like Solomon, while wearing a hat with a Judahite lion, and holding a shield with three lions, again representing the three patriarchs, Solomon, David, and Judah. Behind him, we have a screen window in the design of Fleur de Lis. His father was Falk of Jerusalem, a crusader king who devoted his life to retaking the Holy Land from the Muslims. Understand that while the Visigoths were defeated by Moors due to instability and lack of unity, the Franks had been the ones who stopped Islam from spreading into Europe and taking it over. I just want to clarify something really quick. I ended up posting this on my Instagram story the other day and I was asked a really good question. They asked, why would God allow Islam to thrive and conquer Christian kingdoms if God really loved us and if Christianity was real? And there are actually a few answers to this. First of all, sin and disobedience of Yahweh's laws will always result in captivity and oppression. Keep in mind Ezekiel 39 verse 23. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them, and gave them into the hands of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword. See, the nations who were conquered by Islam had been disobedient to Yahweh. For example, the Byzantine Empire was Christian on the surface, but clearly contradicted many biblical teachings. The same can be said for the Romans, as well as the Visigoths in Spain. Now the second thing you need to consider is that it ties into the tribe of Reuben's prophecy. Keep in mind these two verses. Genesis 49 says, Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, 
than defilest thou it. Judges 5 says, For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. So we can see that Reuben was a divided tribe who were unstable as the waters and had a waning hold on power. I encourage you to watch my video on the tribe of Reuben because you would see how the divisions of Reuben end up spreading into multiple tribes such as the Franks, Gauls, and Goths. Now, the Muslim Moors conquered Hispania and defeated the Visigoths who were massively outnumbered. Prior to this invasion, the Visigoths had been divided by civil war and lacked unity in leadership. Furthermore, these Visigoths were Arian Christians, meaning they did not believe the divinity of Christ. Therefore, they were defeated and sent into captivity. Why? Yahweh wants us to experience the toll of our sin and is seeking repentance from the disobedient. Now understand this. While the Visigoths were conquered, there was still a group of Reubenites who did believe the divinity of Christ amongst the Frankish tribe. When the Moors under the Umayyad Caliphate attempted to migrate north and conquer France, they were met by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours. The Umayyads had 12 times as many casualties, with a ratio of 1,000 to 12,000 deaths. The Umayyads had 25,000 to 50,000 troops, while the Franks only had 15,000. Ask a Muslim to explain that. You know, they seem to think that God's with them in all their wars and that they win and conquer because of Allah. Well, what happened when you met a real group of Christians? Christian Israelites, for that matter. So to recap, if we keep in mind that Reuben was the firstborn and originally carried the birthright, it makes sense as to why the fleur-de-lis was first used and became most prominent amongst the royal Davidic lineage ruling over the descendants of Reuben in France. The authority and blessing of the birthright was later passed to Ephraim, explaining the Davidic lineage within the UK, and the rise of fleur de -lis symbolism in Wales, Scotland, and England as well. That said, it's not just birthright nations who carried this symbol. Remember Solomon had over a thousand lineages, and his seed is scattered throughout the nations. So the symbol also arose in royal dynasties and in nations such as Albania with the House of Topia, Lithuania with the Sapia family, Bosnia with the Kotromanich dynasty, in which we see King Turko's gold coin, depicting him in knight's armor, holding a shield with three fleur-de-lis, being positioned between two more fleur-de-lis, also Serbia with the Nemanja dynasty, and here we have a coin of Stefan Milutins in which he is holding a fleur-de-lis scepter seated between two more fleur-de-lis. Not to mention that in a painting of Stefan at an early age, you can see his prominent blue eyes, a trait that Solomon passed down to him. You also have Hungary with the House of Anjou as well as the Arpad dynasty from which Bela IV was born. His seal depicts him with a fleur-de-lis scepter. There was also the House of Capet in Hungary, from which Charles I was born, and he also minted coins with the fleur-de-lis on them. Next you have Germany, where we see a fleur-de-lis in the seals of Charles IV of Luxembourg and Rudolf of Swabia, or Holland with the Gerolfing Counts, where we see William II holding a fleur-de-lis scepter. Plus, if you look into his lineage, it was long associated with the lion rampant, as we see in art of their progenitor Gerolf, Dirk I, Floris III, Dirk VI, Dirk VII, William I, William II, John I, Floris V, Johann II, Johann III, Albrecht I, Arnulf, and numerous others. Not to mention, Flanders in Holland is a site known for multiple archaeological findings of fleur de -lis coins. It is also a location with tons of lion heraldry. 
There is also Norway, where King Hakon V displayed it in numerous coins and seals. Here is a 1305 seal of him seated with a fleur-de-lis scepter and around him we see a ring with fleur-de-lis on it. Here is a seal from the year 1300 which depicts Hakon V holding a lion rampant shield and wearing a fleur-de-lis crown, while on a horse with a lion rampant cloak. There is also another fleur-de-lis to the left of him. Hakon's daughter, Princess Ingeborg, is also seen wearing a fleur-de-lis crown. And if you take it all the way up to the progenitor of their royal dynasty, the coin of King Sver shows him with a fleur-de-lis crown, as well as four fleur-de-lis on the obverse. Hakon VI also has a fleur-de-lis scepter and crown in his 1358-1378 seal, though he is not of the house of Sver, but rather the house of Bielbo who also carry lion heraldry. The fleur-de-lis can also be seen over in Finland, which has displayed this lily flower on the crown in their coat of arms from 1600s onwards. Here we see the coat of arms of Finland from the funeral procession of Gustav II Adolf from 1633. Here's the coat of arms of Finland on the tomb of Gustavus I. There is also Sweden, where King Eric XI is depicted with a fleur-de-lis scepter. Now, another place with large traces of fleur-de-lis symbolism is Spain, where it can be found on the national flag, as well as the coat of arms. Now, the fleur-de-lis was not used in royal Spanish heraldry until the 1500s, starting with the red-headed king of Castile, Philip I, and his red-headed wife, Joanna, queen of Castile and Aragon. Now, from this, we can discern that the prior Judahite heraldry in Spain was rather from Zara, the son of Judah, whose bloodline had migrated outwards and become king lines in Europe. We know based off the histories I've discussed in prior videos that Zara's lineage migrated throughout the Mediterranean, towards Spain. Many Zarahites stayed in Iberia and colonized it, while others sailed through the Pillars of Hercules and up to Ireland, where the Hand of Zara emblem is still prominent today. One trace of Zara in Spain is Zaragoza, whose flag and coat of arms depict the Lion of Judah. Now quick mention, I spoke about the Pillars of Hercules, and the Hebrew term Heraklin actually means the merchants. Who were the merchants? They were the Phoenicians, who dominated the seas and kept their contemporaries from sailing beyond the Pillars of Hercules out into the ocean. They'd even make up stories about there being massive sea creatures in order to deter people from sailing out. It was essentially to maintain a monopoly on trade as well as knowledge of additional lands. One of those lands was Ireland and Britain, which were being deforested and mined in by the Phoenicians thousands of years ago. So to act like it's impossible that a lineage can make its way from Israel and up to Ireland is just plain ignorant. Now the one place with the most tie to the Davidic lineage besides Reubenite and Ephraimite nations is Italy, where the Jews had a long-standing history. And it was right here in 70 CE that the Roman Emperor Vespasian decided to send his many legions into Jerusalem. The city had been occupied by Rome for some 70 odd years and now the Jews had revolted and so Rome sacked the city. They burgled the many riches from Jerusalem's temple and knocked it down. They returned to Rome with over 10,000 Jewish slaves in tow and they paraded them right through this forum. But Roman historian Leah Klein tells me that it would have been a horrific and sad parade for many of the onlookers. We're talking about the defeat of Judea. Meanwhile, there were Jews in Rome. I mean, Rome was not just... Roman. There were probably 11 synagogal communities in Rome. That's um, a lot. That's a lot of synagogal communities, but they were named after the emperor. So they took it seriously that they were Roman and Jewish at the same time. They went to the baseball games. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. They, they certainly played Roman and they did everything that a Roman would do, except for their own particular needs as Jews and their own religious traditions. There were at least 30,000 Jews in Rome in the first century CE. Not counting slaves. Not counting slaves. 30,000 Roman citizens who were Jewish. That's a lot of citizens. Which means that they certainly had a voice um, in Rome. They had a voice, and
And now, with the influx of slaves, 20,000 more hands, albeit slave hands. And it's what those hands did that you might find surprising. Within a stone throw of the Forum is the greatest monument of the Roman Empire, the Colosseum. And while it has stood for almost 2,000 years as an example of brilliant Roman engineering and architecture, historian Alan Epstein tells me thousands of its builders have never been truly recognized. But when the job was done, the demand for slaves slumped. Because of huge supply, the bottom dropped out of the slave market in Rome. Slaves once worth a few large aureus were now sold for a few dupanda. That's going from gold to bronze for you barbarians out there. It was a good thing for the Jewish slaves, though, because it meant that many of them were able to buy back their freedom. It's for me, for my wife, and for my family. One. And you might be surprised that after that, most of them didn't leave Rome. Why? It's around 80 CE in Rome, 10 years after the legions sacked Jerusalem and brought home thousands of Jewish slaves to build things like the Colosseum. Many slaves have bought their own freedom, but they're not going back to Judea. After tossing their Roman captors, they find themselves injected into a Jewish community so well established that it offers a welcome home away from home. Flash forward 2,000 years to the long-standing Jewish area in Rome, and I get the details from Alan Epstein. Remember that this was a city, for the most part, where Jews were not particularly mistreated throughout the centuries. One of the reasons, of course, is because there had been such an old Jewish community. This is the longest continuous Jewish community in the world since at least 161 BC. That's the first documented presence of Jews. So at least uh, 2,200 years, and no other city can claim this continuous presence of Jews that Rome has. The first Jews came here voluntarily, long before the Roman conquest of Judea. They came in 161 BCE during the Maccabean era. The Book of Maccabees tells us that they came as envoys to negotiate protection from the invading Syrians. The Romans were happy to oblige and lend their brawn to help Judea maintain its independence. Many of these Jews stayed in Rome and organized the Jewish community. The reason why they come here is because Rome has become the masters of the universe. They've conquered the Western Mediterranean. They're now going toward the Eastern Mediterranean. And so... This was where the action was. This is where the action is. Makes sense to send a delegation of ambassadors and merchants and begin to open up trade with these people who are now obviously going to rule the, uh, the, the roost here. In Italy, multiple provinces have fleur de crests. You have Ferrara, Florence, Parma, Trieste, and likely a few others that I'm unaware of. If you want prophetic evidence that Italy is Judahite, I suggest you watch my video titled The Tribe of Judah Black Hebrew Israelites Debunked. Towards the end of the video, I discuss Judah's Genesis 49 prophecy and show how Italy fulfills it perfectly. So ultimately... The fleur de lis is the royal insignia of David's everlasting lineage, who is still holding the scepter and ruling the world as they were prophesied to. It has been passed on to numerous families' heraldry, which is why we are now able to trace ordinary families from around the world to the royal Davidic lineage. I will quickly list off surnames from the nations I've discussed in order to get the point across. This is by no means all the names that carry the symbolism, just the few I've found thus far. I'll start with my own lineage, Gracie. Our family crest has the Lion of Judah wearing a crown, which alone already indicates royal Davidic lineage. If you trace my lineage all the way up, we inherit our lion heraldry from the house of Denifer, who carried a fleur-de-lis scepter. You have my paternal grandmother, and they have a white lily flower on their crest. You have a maternal great-grandmother of mine, Maria D'Annunzio, who also has three fleur-de-lis on her crest. Then you have other surnames like Brown, Burns, Legros, Napolitano, Bohannon, Sebastiani, Paul, Bettini, Cito, 
Paganelli, Kraus, Schmidt, Manfredi, Manzo, Severson, and many more. But, with all this said, there is another symbol which represents Solomon's descendants through the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon. See, she says, I am the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valleys. This line indicates that the Rose of Sharon represents Solomon's lover, the Shulamite. And with that, keep in mind that this lineage does not tie to the Judah king line from Solomon to Zedekiah, whereas the lily flower does because it was used as their royal insignia. That said, the rose still represents descent from Solomon and his father David, and this lineage eventually branches into multiple royal and noble families throughout Europe. The Rose of Sharon in particular comes in multiple colors, such as red, white, pink, or purple. So it's hard to say exactly which color the Song of Solomon is referring to. And now, it is important to say this. Having a rose symbol in heraldry does not mean you're descended from Solomon. What I believe to be indicative of Davidic descent through Solomon is when the rose is used in tandem with other Judahite symbols, such as the lion or the fleur-de-lis. So let's give off a few examples from the nations I've already gone over. There are three main families who are known for carrying the rose symbol. These are the Tudors, Yorks, and Lancasters, all of which carry Judah symbolism at some point in their lineage. The Tudor's coat of arms depicts three patriarchal lions as well as three fleur-de-lis. They descend directly from Rhys ap Tudor, member of the House of Dinifer, who were symbolized by the lion rampant. One of Rhys ap Tudor's ancestors, Howell the Good, is actually depicted holding a fleur-de-lis scepter. The Tudor's other lineage comes from the Plantagenets, who we've already gone over in this video. The Yorks are also descended from the Plantagenets, and have the exact same crest as the Tudors, minus the dog and the Welsh dragon, which I will be making a video on soon. Lastly, the Lancasters again descend from the Plantagenets, and their coat of arms is three patriarchal lions with three sets of three fleur-de-lis. One notable figure of the Lancastrian branch of Plantagenets was Henry IV of England. He is depicted with a fleur-de-lis scepter while holding a Rose of Sharon. Now, besides royal families in England, it's actually quite hard to find this symbol in other dynasties. Location-wise, we have it on the crest of St. Lucia, which I've already shown to be a French colony, also carrying the fleur-de-lis. You have it on the coat of arms of Finland, which I actually used to create a family banner for myself. What I did was essentially combine all the components of my lineages into one flag. You got the Fitzgerald X, which represents my direct paternal lineage from Ephraim. The Scottish Fleur de Lee frame, which represents my descent from Solomon. Nine Roses of Sharon, also representing my descent from Solomon. And my video on how I know I'm an Israelite explains the significance of the number nine in my life. There's also the Lion of Judah, which I have on multiple lineages of mine. And this lion is holding the two swords, which represent my maternal descent from Levi. But back to locations with the Rose of Sharon. You also have it on the Wap in Rosenheim. The Nun Detalsa Franconia coat of arms. The coat of arms of Lip Germany. The coat of arms of Elani Finland. And even in Norway, where it was on the crown of King Hakon V from the House of Sver, who as we saw earlier also carry fleur de lis symbolism, him and his wife, Queen Euphemia of Rugen, are depicted under eight roses of Sharon. And notice that both of them have prominent red hair, just like their forefather, King David. King Hakon VI from the House of Bielbo also put the rose of Sharon symbol on his royal seal, where we see three on top and two on the side. Again, as we saw earlier, he also carried fleur de lis symbolism. His forefather, Berger Jarl, also had 17 roses behind a lion rampant on his personal coat of arms. So, as we see, this symbol is used far less than the fleur de lis, and there's actually a reason for it. The fleur de lis represents all lineages of Solomon, all 1,000 
whereas the Rose of Sharon represents one of his lineages through the Shulamite. So it only makes sense that it's far less common than the lily flower. And since it's not too common on territorial coat of arms, let's list off some family names that carry this rose symbol. We can start with my mother's mother, the Chano, whose crest has a Lion of Judah holding a Rose of Sharon. This is also seen on the coat of arms of the Henry family, Magni, one of the LeBlanc family crests, on the Donato family crest, again on a Krauss family crest, and definitely on many others that I'm just unaware of. So, besides the Fleur de Lis and the Rose of Sharon, there's one more symbol that you can use to tie yourself to the Davidic bloodline. This would be the Lion Rampant wearing a crown. My family crest, the Gracies, has a Lion of Judah wearing a crown. You also have my great-grandmother, Maria Vellani, and her family crest has a Lion of Judah with a crown as well as another great-grandmother of mine, Gentilina Paschini, who also has this same symbol. Some other examples include the King family crest, which is pretty ironic considering the name is King. You also have St. Pierre, Silva, Tyson, Lincoln, Dugras, and again, many more that I'm unaware of. Now, everything I've gone over in this video would suggest that I am of a Davidic lineage and that the black Hebrew Israelites are a bunch of posers. I'm the ruddy one with red hair and colorful eyes. I'm the one with all four grandparents having heraldry that represents their lineage from Solomon and David. I'm the one who descends from all the monarchs who used this symbol before. I'm the one whose paternal lineage links solely to nations with historic fleur-de-lis and Judah symbolism. I'm the one whose father's name is David. And this is yet another clue as to who the descendants of King David are. Understand that the name David has never been used by ancestors of these groups who claim to be Judahite, neither Africans or indigenous Americans. Matter of fact, there aren't any old African names that derive from Hebrew. Rather, most are Islamic in origin. But all the most popular names amongst nations of European descent are of Hebrew origin. For example, James, John, Michael, David, Joseph, Daniel, Matthew, Joshua, Jacob, Jonathan, Benjamin, Samuel, Adam, Nathan, Zachary, Ethan, Noah, Jesse, Gabriel, Elijah. These are all top 100 names over the last 100 years. In the 1970s, David was the most popular name in Northern Ireland where my paternal lineage is from. My father's name is David. His father's name is David. His father's name is John. His father's name is John. His father's name is John. Name is John. My entire paternal lineage is named after biblical figures. Matter of fact, my mother's family is from Italy, and even her brother's name is David. Yet, you have Kwame and Abdullah who want to tell me that their lineage is of Jacob. Understand that Africans weren't given names like David until British Ephraimites pushed his brother tribes to the ends of the earth, therefore bringing the Holy Book to Africa as well as America in order to evangelize. So, besides the description of David or Solomon sounding like the typical Scotsman, or the heraldry of the Davidic lineage being most evident in Scotland, we also have the name of David being historically linked to Scotland. And I just use Scotland as an example because that's who my father is most related to. The same can be said for France, or Spain, or Wales, or England, or West Germany. All locations my paternal lineage is most related to. What are the odds? Well, as always, people will probably chalk it up to coincidence, but I personally do not believe in coincidences. I believe in design. I believe in a divine plan where everything happens for a reason. So with all that said, I do thank you for watching this video. I appreciate all the support. So have a great day and stay blessed.